Hey folks, Liari here. Today we're reacting to The Future of Reasoning by Vsauce. Honestly, like the thumbnail looks cool and the concept of the video sounds really interesting. So I'm really curious what this is. Let's go. Hey Vsauce, Michael here. Hey. Where is your mind? Is it in your head? I mean, that's where your brain is and your brain helps you remember and plan and make judgments and solve problems. But you also remember and plan with phones and notes and calendars. My brain is and my phone. you make judgments and, and solve problems with all sorts of things. Ugh. You know, when you think about it, the brain is really just a wet lump of fat and protein no firmer than a blob of tofu. But the mind is huge. It's an ever-expanding organ of tissue and wood and stone and steel and people because of communication. Communication mm. allows us to even make other people extensions of our minds. We can access their memories and perceptions and knowledge by simply asking or not. I don't need to learn how to fix a car and practice medicine and vulcanize rubber or remember everything. Other people are doing that for me just as I do things for them. Hmm. We are a species of individuals that is also one big interdependent lumbering growth, a frantic blur of flesh and concrete. We're the Gath from Mass Effect, right? A techno-sapien powered by imaginations and passions made real by a hallowed faculty we call reason. Reason, yes. it is said, guides us to truer knowledge and better decisions. It's allowed us to increase life expectancy, suffer less, work together better, and it's bound to take us further and higher until the end of time. Or is it? The organ we use to reason takes millions of years to evolve, but the fruits of reason grow rapidly and are ever accelerating. Over the next four decades, we are expected to build the equivalent of another New York City every month. And more concrete was installed in the last two decades outside the United States than the U.S. installed during the entire 20th century. This growth means that quality of life around the world is rising. It means that electricity, manufactured goods, food, comfort, and transportation are all becoming more common and accessible. But there are hints that reason and logic are struggling against the complexity of it all, against our growing dependence on the things we've built and their unintended consequences. Nearly every part of life as we know it today involves or relies on a process that releases molecules with lopsided electrical charges. This property causes them to absorb and re-emit thermal radiation, pinging it around so that it escapes into space more slowly. Having more warmer parcels of air means stronger weather events. They can't be pinned to any particular extreme storm, but they make extreme storms in general more extreme and frequent. What's at stake isn't just bad weather, it's disaster. It's more lives lost, more property lost, it's more droughts, more hunger, more famine, more people needing refuge, and an even greater reliance on the very things that caused the problem in the first place. In total, we release about 51 billion tons of such gases every year, and we need to release zero. But how do you rethink everything? Who gets to direct the costs and trade-offs? How do you achieve collaboration between nearly every local and national government when what works in one place won't work everywhere, when decisions affect jobs in one place and food in another, when not just things need to be rethought, but also habits and traditions and values? How do you achieve consensus when a problem isn't obvious to the senses, is far away in space and time, requires solutions that affect people in different ways, and as a product of science, always carries some uncertainty? Good question. The philosopher Timothy Morton calls something so massively distributed in time and space 
and so viscous, so sticky that it adheres to all that touch it, a hyper object. Every civilization that grows at the speed of reason must at some point face hyper objects. In fact, hmm. the fact that we still haven't found evidence of intelligent life beyond Earth has been brought up as evidence that some sort of great filter might. I'm pretty sure. So I played a bunch of um, space simulation games like um, for, uh, 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 Galsiv. That's the only one that's coming to mind right now. Galactic Civilizations 2, I think it was. And that's sort of the stars. Yeah, that's the other one I was trying to think of. And Stellaris and like other stuff. So like, sorry, this is a concept I know about. It exists that few civilizations manage to get past. Or galaxies. That a hyper Last object stage. like our impact on the planet might be such a great filter is not a new idea. What it might take to solve it is the topic of Bill Gates's How to Avoid a Climate <gasps> Disaster. And I decided Whoa. to do this video in partnership with him and his team because the, the way we deal with hyper objects reveals a lot about the mind. It's easy and common to think that we would all be better off if everyone was just more rational, right? But what if reasoning wasn't built for what we've become? Let's begin by looking at behavioral inertia. Behavioral inertia is the tendency to keep doing what you're already doing, status quo bias. It can be a frustrating bias if you desire change, but its origin isn't a flaw. If an organism has managed to survive long enough to reproduce and provide and care for its offspring, then the state of its world was sufficient for its genes to spread. That's all it takes to persist. The types of organisms we see around us will naturally be those that managed to persist and didn't, after reaching that point, rock the boat too much. So behavioral inertia can help slow down the accumulation of unintended consequences and the loss of ideas that work, but it can also slow down innovation and adaptation. Music so nice. If the environmental impacts of our society were more immediate and unignorable, it wouldn't be so tempting to apply this inertial break. But emissions are invisible, and their consequences aren't immediate or local. They impact future people and people far away, those who are different from us, poorer than us, people we will never meet. Mm -hmm. This may be one of the first challenges advancing civilizations face, wielding not just the power of technology and distributed cognition, but also the responsibilities. Extending the mind is really cool. But whether or not a species can extend their empathy might be a great filter. Surely, reasoning will allow us to do that, right? Well, what is reasoning? Well, reasoning The is captions a way vary of from his what he inference. says a lot. An inference is a piece there. of new information extracted from the information you already have. Now, we make inferences all the time every living thing does. For example, we don't have measuring tape tentacles that shoot from our eyes. And what actually enters our brain is just a 2D image. But nonetheless, our brains can infer depth by attending to cues like stereopsis, occultation, perspective, parallax, size. Now, when this happens... All those words I see when I'm playing uh, Dolphin or like PCSX2 and have no idea what they mean. We accept it as reality. We aren't aware of the visual processing that made it possible, and we don't have to be. If, however, we do consciously consider why a certain conclusion was reached, well, then, boom, that's reasoning. Reasoning is the process of making inferences, not automatically and instinctively, but by looking at facts and seeing what conclusions they support. When Eratosthenes calculated the circumference of the Earth to within a percentage or two of the value accepted today, he didn't do it by measuring the Earth, and he didn't just perceive it as self-evident. No, he inferred it from what he knew about shadows and how long it took camels mm. to move. Stories like that make it easy to believe that reasoning evolved because it supercharged our cognitive abilities. I mean, it clearly moves us towards truer conclusions, better decisions, and knowledge no other species could infer. 
attempts to describe the rules of good, orderly reason became logic and mathematics, concepts so general and abstract that while we were still animals, <laughs> armed with them, we were no longer beasts. What? But that's the rub, isn't it? If reasoning is so great, why are we the only species with such a sophisticated grasp of it? And if its purpose is truth and good judgment, why don't we all agree on everything? It's tempting to think that disagreements happen because, well, I am being rational, but those who disagree with me are being irrational. Ugh, if only people would just use logic and reason. What's happened to the world? Well, that's a fair complaint if you're arguing over logic puzzles, but the world is not a logic puzzle. This, however, is one. Paul is looking at Mary. Mary is looking at Peter. Paul is married. <gasps> Peter is unmarried. Is a married person looking at an unmarried person? We don't know. Well, Peter, well, Mary's looking at Peter. So, yeah, we know we don't know because Mary's not married. Oh god, that's hard to say. Person? Yes? No? Or not enough information to decide? That's true, there's not enough information. We don't know if Mary is married. The answer is yes. Huh? You may have thought there's no way to know because we don't know if Mary is married. But look, she either is or she isn't. And if she is, well then she, a married person, is looking at Peter, an unmarried person. True. If she isn't, then Paul, a married person, is looking at her, an unmarried person. So no matter what Mary's deal is, the answer will be yes. When people get this puzzle wrong and the correct answer is explained to them, they almost always immediately see why it's right and change their <laughs> mind. Life is not always like that. Let's take a look at a logical syllogism. Yeah. All elephants are awesome. So true. Michael is an awesome. elephant, therefore, Michael is awesome. Yeah. The conclusion is logically valid. It follows from the assumptions. But are the assumptions true? Yeah. No. I am not an elephant. Also, this premise is subjective. I mean, what does it mean to... They're the same thing. Sorry. To be awesome, can we measure it with an awesomeometer? So you can see why, when analyzing something like our impact on the planet, logic can only be a partial tool. If some people have more to lose than others, who gets to decide which assumptions are fair? Still, though, it would seem that reasoning should be able to help here. If each of us would just attend only to the facts, Surely, we'd all recognize the same reasonable approach. Problem is, that's not how reasoning works. Unlucky. Since the scientific study of human reasoning began about a hundred years ago, it has been found again and again that not only are we bad at reasoning, lazy and biased, but we actually seem almost programmed to be bad, like the flaws are intentional. In an episode of Mindfield, I once used a magician to pull off a little experiment. He asked people to look at two faces and choose which of the two they would prefer to work with, placing their preferences in one. Wait, 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 I choose the person on the right. Pile and those they rejected into another. Hey, then, same. The pile of people they picked were shown again, and each person was asked to provide a reason for why they <gasps> chose that person. But with a little sleight of hand, the magician managed to sneak in some of the faces they had just rejected. Amazingly, the majority of people didn't even notice the trick. Not only that, they were able to effortlessly explain the reasons behind their choice. <laughs> a choice they never actually made. Relatable. Remembering faces you've only seen briefly isn't the easiest thing to do, but other studies have shown that even if the task involves answering questions about one's political beliefs, 
things we would seemingly have a firmer grasp on, nearly half of participants yeah. will fail to notice that the answers they gave have been reversed when they're later asked to explain them. Point is, we seem practically built to give reasons for whatever we think we must, and not the reasons we actually used to reach a conclusion. Devil, that's why people love devil advocating, right? That's like the same concept, basically. What if we don't even use reasons to reach conclusions? Well, let's talk about intuitions. <gasps> Our brains have evolved I... <laughs> over millions of years to react to the world around us in brilliant ways with little to no input from us. Uh, for example, when you notice that someone is upset, you don't consciously think, hmm, okay, so, uh, well, their eyebrows are kind of in that position and their speech seems curt, their posture is, <gasps> These are all reasons to conclude that they are upset. <laughs> no, instead, the belief that they may be upset was just apparent. You intuited it. You know it without exactly knowing how you came to know it. The mood-recognizing parts of your brain operate in a way that is opaque to your awareness. But if someone asks you, why do you think they're upset? You can nonetheless produce all sorts of reasons. Some may have actually been the ones your brain attended to, but they're all just guesses. Instead of using reasoning to come to conclusions, we use conclusions to come to reasons. Hmm. Now, to be fair, we can go the other way. We love puzzles, and when we don't have a strong intuition either way, we can sit down and mull over various reasons to think one thing. This is puzzle music, sorry. Or another. Our love of puzzles suggests that reasoning has a survival value. Organisms that found it pleasurable would be more likely to use it. But when we reason alone, even when we have no motivation to reach any particular conclusion, we still exhibit deep biases that seem less like mistakes and more like features. For example, mm -hmm. it's been shown that between two otherwise similar products, people will prefer to buy the one with more functions. Even if they don't want those functions, never plan to use them and think they're all pointless and overly complicated. Why? Well, it might be that we find such decisions easier to justify to others. We won't wind up being potentially embarrassed when someone asks why we didn't get the product with more functions. Well, after decades of findings like this, Hugo Mercier and Dan Sperber began to hypothesize that reasoning didn't evolve to help us make better decisions, but instead to help us be social. Humans inhabit a cognitive niche on this planet. We aren't strong or sharp or hidden or venomous. Instead, our advantage comes from cognition, reasoning, and cooperation. We can plan hunts, build traps, and engage in coordinated strategies that can be tested and modified on the fly, not by millennia of evolution. Reason allows us to do those things. It's hard to convince people that your intuitions are true, but if you can give reasons for them, it's a whole heck of a lot easier to convince people that you're right. Being able to argue over what the best thing- This is the best photo I've ever- look at their eyes. Oh my god, it's- okay thing to do is is vital when it comes to coordinating action. Reasons also allow us to justify ourselves in the eyes of others, to explain who we are and express the kinds of reasons we like, what others can expect from us, and what we will likely expect from them. This social theory of reasoning helps explain why two people can earnestly and rationally arrive at two different views. They each have their own unique brain and values and dispositions and experiences, and those are what drove their thinking. The reasons they give may or may not be the real reasons they came to their conclusions, but it's the best anyone can do. The social theory also explains why people tend to give such weak reasons for their beliefs at first, or when their intended audience doesn't need much convincing. It would be a waste of time and cognitive resources to construct Grand Slam reasons for everything I said and did and thought when it wasn't necessary. Instead, I can offload some of that work to other people. Uh, for example, I if I that. say, I want to have lunch at ABC Burgers, well, my friend might respond, ah, no thanks, I had burgers yesterday. And I might reply back, oh, well, that's no problem. They also have hot dogs and great salads. 
But if my friend said, nah, no thanks, I'm trying to spend less money eating out this month, I could reply, oh, well, ABC Burgers is really cheap and I've got a coupon. Now what's going on here is that I'm providing reasons only as my friend presses for them. If they press harder and harder, my reasons will become better and better until either I win them over or we come to some different, more harmonious decision. <laughs> so when people appear to be lazy reasoners or to have This bad frustrates reasons, the shit out of me. All, it's usually just the case that they're using reason as it evolved to function socially. It starts <laughs> off weak, improving if yeah. others push it and always tailoring its work to the intended audience. The social theory of reasoning can even explain the existence of biases that otherwise make little sense. For example, you say, well, it frustrates me. I do the same thing. <laughs> uh, I, I'm definitely like an opinionated person. And like, obviously, you can't have an opinion about everything that's like fully researched and backed up. And one of the things that I am trying to improve on is looking like I have a strong, firm opinion that I've thoroughly researched on something when I actually have it. It's hard to break out of that. It would seem that in coming to conclusions about the world, it would behoove an organism to pay particular attention to information that went against what it believed. I mean, that way, they would be able to adjust their beliefs, making them truer, more general, and more complete. To a certain extent, that is what happens, but not always. When someone does their own research, they often come to the very conclusion they wanted in the first place. This is called confirmation bias. Our tendency yeah. to look for, prefer, and interpret information so that it confirms what we already think. It frustrates our ability to accept new inconvenient data and is a problem for the intellectualist view of reason. If reason is for finding truth and making better decisions, why would it have this major weakness? Well, because, the social theory says, reasoning is a group activity. Let's say that I mm. think option A is true and the best, and you think option B is true and the best. Well, if we both researched both options and sifted through reasons in support of both options, we would both have twice the work to do than we would if instead I simply came up with reasons for why I was right and you attended to reasons for why you were right. The confirmation bias at least halves the cognitive work that must be done. Hmm. Now, sometimes a lone reasoner will have a bad idea or a decent idea with some bad parts. I think like one of the things that I remember growing up and obviously still now is like I would always like seek out people to like discuss things with and like have a conversation about a topic with even if I already had like a strong view on something because I always felt like basically what he's saying right like if I'm able to like and obviously like, <laughs> there's ways to do this in a horrible way where you just frustrate and annoy both of you or just the other person um but like in like a perfect environment you're able to actually have like a collaborative conversation where you both put forth your own ideas and try and deconstruct why the other person like not deconstruct because that's a little like too targeted but just like and are aware of like the counter arguments to your own positions then it becomes like a fruitful conversation i feel like an enjoyable one at least i don't know the reasons they have to justify for and argue for it will be sufficient for them and those who intuitively agree, but they may be weak. However, subjected to deliberation, put forth into the machine of collective thought, it can be evaluated and judged, not by one mind or a group of minds thinking alike, but by something very special, the crowd. Humans have long known of the wisdom of the crowds, the phenomenon by which a collection of many people can process information into a conclusion better than any one person could do alone. It's why we don't trust big decisions to a single person, no matter how educated or powerful they are. Instead, we ask a group of people to deliberate, to reason together. In this way, the biases and errors of each is smoothed out and the decision wiser. 
In a famous example, it's been repeatedly shown that if you ask a bunch of people to guess how many jelly beans are in a jar, you'll find that the average of all their answers is closer to the real number than any one individual was alone. What happens is that mm. although some people may guess a number that is, like, way too big, that mistake is balanced out by the fact that others will inevitably guess a number that is way too small. Altogether, their disagreement evens out into spectacular accuracy. We have now arrived at the problem. Reasoning evolved to be used socially, where many different perspectives had to all... I just want to say, sorry, I had a flashback after he said the jelly bean jar thing. I'm, unless my memory is incorrect, which it totally could be, I'm pretty sure, like, in fifth grade or whatever, we had this, like, haunted house type thing where, like, the elementary school, like, different classes had their own separate, like, haunted classroom and you would, like, walk throughout all the classrooms and, like, get stuff or, like, have huge themes and cool stuff like that. And I remember one of the classrooms had a jelly bean jar and I got, I guessed it right. I said 2002. It was right. I, best moment of my life. I'm looking back on it. I feel like I was just the only person who guessed a number that could be right. And they gave it to me. me we'll see. I, I don't know. I, I don't know why I said we'll see because I'll never find that out. But yeah, that, that's like the, there are a few things in my life that I'm really proud of, but that's the one I most. Deliberate towards a common conclusion. Such contexts are becoming less and less common, and it is becoming easier and easier to simply be a lone reasoner, justifying only a particular viewpoint without doing the harder work of deliberating and acting. The internet gives voices to more perspectives than ever before in our history, but it also makes it easy to disengage from accountability and to find places where everyone believes what you Zoom in scaring me. Furthermore, because of technology, we confront more issues more rapidly than ever before that we are expected to have opinions about, and the growing complexity and specialization of the modern world makes it difficult for each of us to have well-informed, prepared reasons for the accelerating accretion of intuitions we must form. In response, we look for people who can defend our intuitions for us. The reasons they give don't have to be good, just good enough that we can feel like justification exists. In the past, unconvincing reasons had to be painted on sandwich boards, but now, the democratization of communication means that even unpopular, unconvincing, nonsensical ideas can be presented with the same trust-inducing typefaces and professional look as common ones. People can challenge the weak reasons of others, show them to be contradictory, and produce better reasons for their side. But to what end? It's all preparation for a debate that never comes. We each play a very small role in deciding how society is run. The caption is you play, he changed it to we each. Uh, sorry, it's just like the, re the rhetoric there changes. Like it, that, that changes like how you feel about the sentence. And we each, I think, is a better way to spin it. It's just like, I don't know, it's neat. Even if a good faith discussion between a representative slice of America came to a resolution, if nothing can come of it, why not just throw shade and sick burns or revel in the pleasure of reasoning by treating everything like a big giant puzzle. It's easy to think that it doesn't matter because after all, those in charge, the brilliant scientists and powerful billionaires will surely come to the rescue. So Some true. giant <gasps> techno salvation is surely on the horizon. Techno salvation's all capital. I'm sorry, his captions are so good. <laughs> Perhaps it is. But everything we know about reason is being sarcastic. That those implementing it should be held accountable by not as about many the captions. different perspectives as possible. This is true. Leaders could lead deliberations and be elected for their ability to moderate social reasoning. But that's boring. Why lead when you could follow? Look at what some people believe and generate reasons for why they're right, and they'll love it. Of course, the hard work, the real work, the work that truly elevates us on this planet 
is not in telling people that they're right, but in trying to convince others, and in doing so, use reason as it evolved to be used. One of the like more interesting things, and I mean, obviously, like this video was made a year ago. I think it was topical when this video was being made. Um, when you look at like COVID, like information, right, and like the struggle of help public health officials to communicate in a way that is PR friendly. Where like you just want to have you just want to state the facts, but if you just state the facts, that's not good enough. You need to actually market it if you want to be listened to, and I don't, it's a very interesting conundrum to deal with. The future of reason may in fact be the past of reason. In practice, what does all this look like? Well, some researchers have gone so far as to recommend National Deliberation Days, where citizens celebrate by literally joining small groups and talking through their opinions and comparing reasons. Tests of such strategies have shown that a return to the small, targeted discussions our reasoning abilities evolved to excel in leaves all participants with a greater understanding of not just what they believe and why, but about decisions that could actually be made and actions that could be taken. This is big. Okay, this is like kind of like the reason why I like the Jubilee like Spectrum videos and stuff, where they're like just a group of people talking about different things. Is it's basically like this kind of concept, only of course I, with more self selection because you know you're going on a YouTube show. Others have gone even further, recommending that the future of reason at its best is the construction of a lotocracy. A form of government where decisions are made not by elected leaders, but by people literally chosen at random. We decide the fate of a person this way. Why not the fate of the people? That'd be terrifying. If decisions were made not by politicians alone, but at least occasionally by groups of actual citizens representing differences in thought, not just geography, who were brought together and paid for their time to learn from experts and then deliberate on an assigned issue until a conclusion was reached or, at the least, a recommendation. Instead of being motivated by re-election, money, attention, and power, individuals chosen at random would have only their conscience to guide them. I feel like, th how do you like make sure they're good experts? Is like a easy criticism? I don't, I'm, let's see if he continues. Special interests and corporations wouldn't be able to cozy up to those likely to be elected because if any one of us could someday serve, they'd have to cozy up to and protect all of us. Instead of the learning and deliberation being done by people you will never meet with offices and buildings you can't access, gradually, over time, more and more of your very own neighbors would have had the honor. People chosen at random would obviously lack the same celebrity it would status improve civics engagement. and mandate that elected leaders cultivate and achieve. And iconic figures we relate to aren't bad, but our understanding of reasoning is making it more and more clear that we evolved not to leave the thinking up to a few great minds, but to the authority of the great mind, the lumbering organ of thought that is everyone and everything. This we is assume a lot of good how actors. democracy first worked. Lotteries were used to fill many political positions in ancient Athens. Aristotle explained that the appointment of magistrates by lot is thought to be democratic, and the election of them is oligarchic. An oligarchy is government by only a small number of people. Look, regardless of how reason is brought back to its social roots, if we can build more and better arenas for deliberation and use them to apply reason properly to hyper objects like the impact of our emissions on the planet, a lot we'll of have people just don't one care. A lesson to people a hundred, a thousand years in the future. I like to think that although widening participation will be difficult, it might provide us with a kind of existential security. The impact of emissions on our planet is not going to be the last hyper object we face. If we can do a good job with it, maybe far in the future, when our civilization has advanced to the point at which, I don't know, people can be quantumly recreated or something, they'll look back at our time and say, hey, let's bring them all back to life. We could use the cooperative abilities they had then. 
Ultimately, the old saying that history is the great teacher isn't a bad guide. We will all someday be teachers ourselves because someday we will all be history. We will someday be the ancients and we can choose what that will mean. And as always, thanks for watching. I... Oh, there's no curiosity box in this video. Is it really just the outro? Oh, wow. But, um, I feel like this was really good. I really like, like, the ideas and the things that he presents. What's the most replayed bit? Oh, this? <laughs> that makes sense. I feel like it is hard for me to advocate for... This like random selection of people to deliberate and construct a response to problems in part because like how does that work like there's a lot of things that get decided on and like how do you update it when like our like when things change like how big are the groups right like there's 300 million people in the united states right okay okay all right let's do some googling how many bills are passed by Congress in a month? Or, okay, that was the worst Google ever, but this is what we need. All right, govshack.us, perfect. So, all right, so this is the 117th Congress. Congress serves for two years, right? Their uh, House of Reps are inaugurated January 3rd. They serve until their the next books are inaugurated. So, okay. Obviously, there's a trend in recent history, I believe, to where less things get legislated. So that's important to note, right? I think, like, at a very clear, quick, like, search, I can see that there's all these years seem to range between, like, 600 to 1100, with a lot more being near the 900s, whereas once you start getting into the 90, 96s, or the 90s, I should say, it starts getting a lot fewer. Um... Resolutions are a thing. Getting a vote's a thing. All right. What's other legislation? Wait. Is that, like, stuff that's just, like, proposed? Four to six million words of new law in each two years. However, those words have been enacted in fewer but larger bills. Yeah, that's true. That's an important thing to note. Just because there's fewer bills passed doesn't mean there's, like, less deliberation and stuff. It's just a byproduct of how our system seems to work nowadays. So, this is actually a bad guy. Like, I can't just look at this and say, oh, roughly you'd have to enact 500 and, oh, let's go with last, the last Congresses. Roughly you'd have to enact 1,229 pieces of legislation, and this is the highest. This is very productive. Um... So, because a lot of it is basically combining different things that would be voted on by different groups of people. But, let's just use, this was a high year, right? A lot of legislation. Um, so, we can say, roughly, if there's 300 million people, right? Divided by, let's say, they're 10 person groups. Then, okay, let's say a Supreme Court. 9 million groups. So, that's 33 million, right? You need, like, 33 million groups? Wait, 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 wait. The fuck am I saying? One second. I, I think I messed up somewhere. Yeah, okay, sorry. You'd, you'd have... Okay. I'm dumb. First, let's strip away, like, adults. Or kids. How many adults in the U.S.? Uh, uh. Oh, wow, that's more than I thought. Oh, a 10% increase. That explains it. Holy shit, that's a lot, a huge increase. Okay. Anyways, 258 million. So, you would be able to cover, like, let's say... Okay, wait, 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 wait. 100,000, 20... Okay, this is... I don't know why I'm doing this live. Uh, 29 million, right? you would have about 29 million potential groups. Now, I mean, I guess, 
theoretically. But then you also have to, like, account for the fact that we're a fucking, like, we have a county-level decision-making. We have um, state-level decision-making. We have school board-level decision-making. We have regional-level decision-making in some ways with, like, interstate compacts and stuff. But, um, or, like, trade, I don't know, fuck, I don't, interstate agreements. Anyways, um... So my point is, that sounds like a really difficult thing. So I think my, there's probably a better route to look at it. Sorry, that was a very long tangent. Um, I don't even know what I'm trying to say anymore. I just think, like, there, there's things to think about here. Really wish there was more discussion of stuff like this. Not just what decisions are made, but who gets to make them. Oh, and who gets to make them. But a society-wide information processing and decision-making process. It's true that, like, the rate of evolution in society, especially nowadays, is often faster than what most people can, like, grapple with, right? Like, you can see it with, like, parents saying, like, outdated things that are weird. Uh, um, or even, like, I'm sure, like, I'm, like, fucking 24. So, like, that's, like, a real, like, the, the things that I say in the culture that I grew up in is different than what's what, how people grow up nowadays or how people grew up 10 years before me. And it feels like that, like, like the culture shift where, like, the how you act and stuff changes radically is becoming, like, quicker, I believe. I'm warning this bad, but, like, Basically, society is changing faster. And it's interesting to think about given how our reasoning abilities work and how evolution takes a long time to occur. This has got to be the best video Vsauce ever uploaded. It brilliantly tackles modern problems and puts a philosophical spin on them, all mixed in with a call to change everyday policies of discussion for the better. This video is an inspiration for all and could genuinely help civilizations now and in the far, far future. I do think, like, the concept of the video is really nice, and it's important that people know that, like, having conversations is important um, with folks who may have different views than you. Michael, you've honestly shaped my mind coming of age. And of course, you don't always need to, but um, it's just, like, a, a cool thing. Michael, you've honestly shaped my mind coming of age into adulthood so much you can't imagine. You know the reason I fell in love with tech and physics in my early 20s. Now I've worked in technology slash with for years. Shaped the way I view and inquire about the universe and our place in it. I definitely, like, Vsauce gets a lot of views and his videos are about cool, important topics. I love the idea of a lotocracy. Michael explained it so perfectly. We know that the average of many people's guesses and opinions more often than not lead to the most sensible. As a transgender person, <laughs> that scares me a little, right? Like, there are things where people get things wrong, um, where, like, the average view is wrong. Where, like, even coming to an average view on the particulars of different parts of it are wrong. But, yeah, I, it's complicated. Just like, the, like, I feel like that's how you get, like, a t rule by, like, terror majority, right? And obviously, like, Michael Vsauce was sick, explicitly said that like you would want them to have to talk to experts first. But how do you select the experts? <laughs> like, what's the criteria? It's hard to get people to agree on that. But in our democracy, so many people just feel lost, feeling like they don't matter, or are overwhelmed with all the politics involved. A lotocracy would be like getting all of the positives from a direct democracy without most of its drawbacks, such as having to process millions of individual opinions, would be amazing that, like, I, I feel like there are better ways to reform the voting system or to reform, like, financial contribution laws than instituting a radical change like this, which I have a lot of apparent issues with. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. I could be completely off base. I, I'm not a fucking expert, but that's my opinion. This is a summary of everything I learned in philosophy class. Thanks, Vsauce. Yeah. We just appreciate that Vsauce has consistently made nothing short of phenomenal content for almost a decade now.
Oh, as it pertains to addictions treatment, patients are often taught to never give reasons to friends when refusing to do drugs. Any reason you give is simply the place someone else tries to break into your resolve. A successful ex addict will almost always say no, and that's it. It's. This is really true. I've been in a lot of situations with people doing drugs before. Um. People will often ask, why not? And then the second you say anything, they will break in with a reason for why you're not is not good enough. Um, yeah, true. Important to remember. Vsauce's background music has been so insanely great, it's unbelievable. They fit the context so perfectly. Yeah. Alright. Okay, I'll... Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, this person says it. I'm curious what the replies are. There's one massive is issue with the lotocratic scenario you propose. Who chooses the expert that guide the decision makers? People tasked with that job are essentially the ones making the decision. They choose what information gets heard and what doesn't, and essentially meld the minds of those random decision makers to their desires. And then this person says the people with that job would also be chosen in the lottery. So, and then this person says, who decides on the criteria one must meet before qualifying as an expert? I mean, that's true. I mean, you can go, like, credentials, but I, the, the problem is this implements a, in a, um, what's the word? It, a bias for tradition, right? Because if you're only allowing people with credentials and with, like, elite credentials, right, or however you define it, you're based, and, like, Obviously, like, you wouldn't do, like, the most vague credentials because then you're basically letting anyone in. So at some level, you're, like, restricting people, and the decision to make that restriction can be very difficult and, it, and make it when new issues arise or information that contradicts old information arises, it can breed, like, um, an adherence to the past. Now, our current system does that too in a lot of ways. Obviously, like, most democracies in the world, as far as I know, have some element of, like, not allowing radical change all at once and, like, basically making sure things have a real consensus to a degree, right? And, like, I, there's issues with that too. But, um, but I'm basically just, like, vaguely referring to the checks and balances system in the U.S., right? Um, so, it's just... Like, you could have the experts of the domains, energy, social justice, law, act be democratic, dem 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 democratically vo voted by all, by the previous group, by the previous experts, by qual- But how do you can, like, doesn't this, how do you, like, expose new ideas? You could even have experts applying to each group, the group choosing the experts they will listen to them by themselves from among the applicants, or you could ha even have the random views deciding on the rules for themselves and evolve over time. I mean, yeah, like, th there's never one perfect solution. But, like, when you're talking, like, you really don't want to get this wrong. I, I would definitely be okay with, like, individual counties or, like, some sort of local government do testing this out, right? And seeing how it works and what system seems to work best. Like, that's fine. But when you talk about, like, radically changing national or even, like, international societies to be chosen by lotto, it gets really difficult, I feel like, to expand that. I don't know. This is definitely the most, like, argumentative I've ever felt at the end of a video. Um, hopefully it wasn't too off base. I feel like it's really, like, I don't get how, like, political fucking, like, content creators do this shit where they talk about actual issues all day. Because, like, I, I only, like, talk about random stuff when it actually, like, personally interests me. And even that's, like, hard to construct, like, a solid argument when you're talking, like, spur of the moment and trying to, like, not have dead air. I don't know. It's really hard. Anyways, thank you for watching, folks. I hope you have a good rest of your day. Bye! Hey, folks. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to like the video, subscribe on YouTube, follow on Twitch, and have a great rest of your day. Bye.